Okay, hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar on IAGHD's recent technical reports on the criteria for depleted reservoirs to be developed for CO2 storage. My name is Samantha Needs and I'm a technology analyst at IAGHD. So just a quick disclaimer slide that I need to show you. Um, IAGHD are, part, are an energy technology collaboration program, part of the IEA's energy technology network. We are autonomous from the IEA, and so any views expressed today in this webinar do not necessarily reflect those of the IEA. So today I'm going to start with a very quick introduction to the IEA GHG programme and then give a brief background to this study. And then the contractors, the Bureau of Economic Geology at the University of Texas at Austin, will provide a more detailed look at the study. So IAGHD was established in 1991 and we are a member-based organisation with strong membership involvement. Our members meet twice a year and they decide on the technical studies undertaken by the programme. And the technical reports produced are used by policymakers but are not policy prescriptive. So IAGHD's main aim is to provide, to provide information on the role that technology can play in reducing greenhouse gas emissions from the use of fossil fuels and biomass. And our main focus is CCUS. And we pride ourselves on providing information that is objective and independent, that is policy relevant but not policy prescriptive, and work that is reviewed by external experts. And the IAGHD programme is able to do what we do thanks to our valued members. We currently have 35 members from across the world, made up of countries, companies and organisations. So we help to initiate and develop knowledge sharing and the transfer of information in many different ways through many different pathways. And we have a number of main activities, as you can see here on this slide. So we have published over 350 technical reports and reviews. Our international research networks span a wide range of areas and facilitate international collaboration and more knowledge sharing. Events such as the post combustor Capturing Conference Series and the GHGT Conference Series are popular and very well attended, with the latter having established itself as the principal international conference on greenhouse gas mitigation technologies, especially CCS. And our next GHGT conference will be held from the 23rd to the 27th of October this year in France. We have received over 800 abstracts that are now in the process of review and selection. And we expect the registration will open later this month or perhaps early April. Um, so keep an eye out for this on the GHGT website at ghgt.info. Oh, sorry. Can you see my screen still? I've just lost it on mine. Yes. You can see my screen. Oh, perfect. That's good. So I am um, sorry about that. I've been a bit of technical issues on my end. There we go. So sorry, I skipped ahead a couple of slides by accident there. So just a very quick note on our webinar procedures for today. So all attendees will have their mics muted throughout. If you do have a question at any point for our speakers, please type your question into the question tab on your control panel, which you can see here with the little arrow there. We will have time at the end of the session to answer audience questions. and I'll try and get through as many as we can in the time we have. And just note that this webinar is being recorded and will be made available on our YouTube channel shortly after the event. So onto the background and motivation for this study on the criteria for depleted reservoirs to be developed for CO2 storage. So the potential CO2 storage capacity in deep saline formations and to a lesser extent storage associated with CO2 EOR is fairly well understood. The benefit of documenting and evaluating key criteria for depleted oil and gas reservoirs for CO2 storage would be to provide a more refined estimation of the potential storage capacity worldwide. And depleted hydrocarbon fields could be ideal for storage of CO2 as they are quite widespread and many are close to larger point sources of CO2. And IAGHD's members felt this was an important topic to look into further. So the aim of the study was to identify the key criteria to assist in the development of depleted hydrocarbon fields for CO2 storage and to consider the advantages and disadvantages of such sites. 
and the study provides original research to achieve these aims. So for your reference, uh, the report number for this publication is 2022-01 and it was published earlier this year. The work was contracted out to the BEG at the University of Texas at Austin with contributions also from researchers at the Weber Energy Group at the university. So I'm going to pass over to the study contractors now who will take you through their results, key findings and their conclusions. So please welcome Alex Bump, Sahar Bakshian, Sue Havorka and Josh Rhodes. And just a reminder, if you do have any questions at all, type them in at any points into that question tab on your control panel. OK, Alex, I can see you're here now. So over to you. Tom's going to share your screen. Thank you. And just to check, can you see my screen? Can you see the slides? Yes. Yeah, Perfect. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. So, first of all, thank you, Sam, for the introduction. Second, um, thank you all for tuning in today. And I need to adjust the screen so that I can see the slides as well. Pardon me a moment. Okay, so as Sam said, there is attraction to depleted fields, but of course they're not all created equal. So depleted fields in some cases can be really attractive for CCS. They have proven reservoirs, proven seals, uh, often abundant existing data, including reservoir performance data. They have a unitized land position that is a single land holding that uh, covers the entire field. They have potentially reusable, reusable infrastructure, which if it is reusable, leads to a lower cost, shorter development time, and in net, a lower risk than a greenfield development. That's the attraction. But of course, not all fields are created equal. So there is a wide range of things that people call depleted fields that spans post-production hydrocarbon fields to sin production that is depleting hydrocarbon fields, and even CO2 EOR. So right from the get-go, there is a range of depleted fields. And of course, even if you compare like with like, all reservoirs are not created equal. Some may not be suited to the storage needs of a given project. Increasing pressure related to injection, of course, creates new risk on the seal. Legacy wells create potential weak points and infrastructure may or may not be reusable. In that aggregate, it may in fact be a liability. So the point of this study is to come up with criteria for how you efficiently and effectively identify viable candidates for CCS. And it's not to replace um, the detailed work that's required for actually um, characterizing depleted fields. It's simply meant to address and identify where it is worth putting your attention, your time, and your effort. So the report is set up in effectively three parts. The first is a catalog of case studies, um, looking at the geology, the production history, and the storage outcomes. The second part was to look at the impact of some key uncertainties, uh, things that we thought might have an impact, uh, but have been largely overlooked. Uh, so things like pressure depletion, the effect of residual hydrocarbons, and the economics of infrastructure reuse. And then the third part is trying to put those things together and create integrated screening criteria. So as you have seen, there are four authors on this study. Uh, Sue will take you through the case studies. Uh, Sahar will take you through pressure depletion and uh, impact of residual hydrocarbons. And then Josh will show you, share with you the economics of infrastructure reuse. And finally, I'll come back and look at integrating screening criteria. So Sue, over to you. Uh, thanks, Alex. Um, it's my pleasure to uh, talk about the case studies. Um, uh, we had a, a lot of fields to choose from, and we, we down-selected um, uh, some end members to represent the diversity in the population of depleted fields. An uh, interesting issue uh, for us when we started this was, what is a depleted field? Um, and so we decided to be inclusive, um, include uh, depleted oil fields, depleted gas fields, and pressure depleted fields. Those are not the same thing. You know, you could have a field that's still producing oil that's not very pressure depleted, 
um, or producing gas or one that um, or one that's pressure depleted, but there's still considerable resource left in it. We decided just to keep include them all and try to include um, end members, different different uh, cases. Um, a depleted field can be um, reused not only for storage, but for enhanced oil production. Uh, that's a lot of the options. And we decided to include um, some, some of those end members uh, where, where depletion was followed by reuse uh, because they're so abundant um, as cases um, that's by, by far the biggest depleted field outcome is EOR, um, but not the only option at this point. Uh, we included, tried to include populations that were onshore and populations that were offshore that are impacted by the, have a big a difference in how the inter infrastructure interacts with the reservoir. And uh, we considered, um, went one quick screen whether they were, um, had injected a lot of CO2, a tiny test amount of CO2, or planned, and we decided to include all of those. So you see the distribution. We also tried to scatter them about um, uh, to get some uh, populations, but we screened somewhat for denser data availability. So places that were interesting fields that we didn't couldn't find out enough about and during the scope of the project and are regrettably not included in the case study. Next, Alex. So the advance the slide. Yeah. So so the um, Alex told you the the benefits and the and the risks. I'm going to go through some of these in detail. We're going to show um, not, that a benefit, a big benefit of the depleted field is that you know the geology. The second related benefit is that you know a lot about the fluid flow and the pressure history, and so that you're fluid flow model is not based on um, only geologic inputs, but also uh, calibrated for a long performance period, which is a huge uncertainty reducer that you have this data. Um, that you know the seal performance, it, it retained a hydrocarbon column in the past and we know over a certain area. So that uncertainty is, is uh, very significantly reduced and it has, but it has known volumetrics. So we know how it responded to extraction and we know how much oil and gas came out. This doesn't equate to how exactly how much CO2 can go in, but it sure reduces the degrees of freedom and allows you to um, make much more, much more confident estimates of how, um, how refilling would um, interact over time and total volume. Um, and a really important thing I put in yellow is kind of the obvious that depleted fields work. They've been, used for injection of CO2 extensively. Um, um, there, there is, we found no cases where um, the uh, uh, scoping study advanced far enough that it was published that for which the, you know, it was not technically viable. So many depleted fields are gonna make the cut. Um, of course, there may be some that were left on the table um, that we wouldn't know about. Um, and they're not available in the case study, but it was a cheerful um, uh, outcome of the survey of the cases. Next slide. So let's just let's dissolve, um, go in a little more detail of what we find from the cases about the challenges. Um, every depleted field has complex and highly perturbed field fluids. They have hydrocarbons in them because that's the definition. They're highly perturbed because they've been the fluids have been moved around. Um, Alloxanous water, or maybe gases, and maybe other fluids have been introduced. Um, the distribution, it's very hard to back calculate what the distribution of those fluids are in the field, so that you want to do a history match model, but you, you try to match the production history accurately enough to actually determine where the remaining fluids are in the field is difficult. Um, Sahar is going to talk a little bit about handling complex fluids and what it tells us about capacity. Um, the second challenge is, is the, that the infrastructure is used. I keep joking with people saying that used infrastructure is just, everyone has an intuition. It's like having a used car. There are reasons to buy a used car. In fact, I often buy used cars, you know, I, I don't want um, for uh, cost reasons for to keep the depreciation costs down. So that, and Alex pointed out there are many reasons to go for something that's used, but it's used. So we'll, we'll, um, Josh will give us a little bit of information about the used infrastructure, nature of infrastructure. Um, the, the reservoir has also been used. Um, so it, 
there are geomechanical issues related to pressure depletion. We found no information about the negative information about this in the case studies that worry that somehow um, depressurization will have damaged the reservoir of the seal is out there, for example, in the North Sea fields that are in shock, but it, it has not come up in the, um, in the case studies that we um, examined. So it is, it's, it's certainly not a broad in your face everywhere kind of issue. Um, the capacity is also fixed. And Sahar will talk a little bit about um, the limitations of capacity in depleted fields. The monitoring can be quite complex because of the past use and the complexity of the fluids um, uh, that that you have um, the, an, un, an unusual situation in terms of uh, geologically that there may be um, uh, anomalies at the surface related to the charge history. Um, seepage, for example, is pretty common. That meaning over geologic time, there's a hydrocarbon signature throughout the column near the depleted field. There, um, in addition, the perturbation from the production history is complex, and you have to, as you say, you don't have a clean baseline that we start with everything in equilibrium. Everything's out of equilibrium. And the public acceptance. One of the things we see from the case studies is the public acceptance is complex. That I'll give you. There are places it's an advantage, there are places it's a disadvantage. Okay, let's see this cases. So the knowledge of geology is excellent in depleted fields. You'll never get this kind of data from a saline formation. <laughs> you can eventually work it up by investing quite a lot, but the depleted field knowledge is just, uh, you know, really attracts the, the geotechnical person's eye. Uh, look at that. Aren't those beautiful? I had to stop myself so they stay big enough. Okay, next slide. <laughs> um, uh, the, the knowledge about fluid flow and pressure history is also, um, this is the one that makes the engineer's heart beat fast to say, oh, look, we can, we, we have all this data, we can invert this and get and really quantify how the injection will go. Um, um, and of course there are limits, but, but they, having this dense data of how it performed before is just really high value. Um, next slide. Um, there, what we mean by depletion is different. So we see in the Altmark case on the on the uh, left, um, uh, a depleted gas field that's depleted and dead and gone. You know they're not going to not going to get used. Um, whereas in the uh, the next two, Wayburn and, and Wasson, um, the the depletion was was actually there was it bumped up first by a water flood. Most most enhanced oil recovery follows a water flood. So in the red one in the middle, you see you know, uh, stimulation by water flood, and then a and then a, a CO2 injection in green. Um, that in both both slides it um, brought the production back up. Uh, so in effect, sort of undepleted the field by using an enhanced recovery technique that liberates additional oil. But both of these. Uh, um, are take in part anthropogenic CO2. Moyburn takes 100% anthropogenic CO2 uh, permian base and gets about a third anthropogenic CO2. Um, and then Sacroc, which is the oldest field in our portfolio, and you notice that even though it's depleted, it's still in operation. So they're still getting enough oil to, once having put that infrastructure in, it, it, it continues to operate, continues to make money. They, at this stage of depletion, they wouldn't begin a begin a flood, but they can continue a flood. So a depletion definition of, of what the end game looks like is highly variable depending on the economics. Next slide. Um, the monitoring is, so I'm giving only one example of the complexity of the monitoring. In some places, 3D, which which we like a lot, is excellent. You see a case from uh, Wavern on the left where these long horizontals that were used to in inject the CO2 have bright spots along them. That's the in place CO2, um, you can see some uh, uh, fracture trends um, at an angle to the to the long uh, horizontals. Um, you know, quite a lot of information about the performance of this field is available from the, the 3D, the 4D time lapse seismic images um, that are detecting where the uh, CO2 is substituting for the water. And the and the middle one, you can see another case of pretty good seismic imaging. This this is um, from Hastings, um, so a, a Gulf Coast reservoir that received anthropogenic CO2, um, um, a large a million tons a year from from the air products uh, um, sub hydrogen unit 
it's not very well known, but it's a nice depleted, we, a depleted field that we had opportunity to know about. So found this obscure, <laughs> obscure um, uh, uh, time-lapse 3D image. You can see the image, the CO2 plume growth. Um, this one is not as informative, but um, still it's a very nice, strong signal. Um, and then we see um, a, a case study from Altmark where the downhole pressure is, is very complex and not well understood even after monitoring because of the comp they couldn't get the complexities of the system to resolve. We don't know why the reservoir response is so muted in the blue uh, compared to the uh, red. They couldn't history match it. So monitoring can be complex. It has something to do with the complexity of the reservoir, complexity of the fluid, complexity of the completions, which one, too many th variables can't can't uh, separate them out with available data. So don't expect monitoring in a depleted field to be a dream job. Um, we, sometimes we go above the zone to just try to get out of the res complexity of the reservoir response and say, are any of the penetrations leaking? Get a clean, um, so that's a way, another way to get a clean signal. We used, this was used to propose it all Mark and use the grand field. Next slide. And the, the um, I thought, I, when we proposed to this, I said, yeah, the public will, who knows about the subsurface will have a much easier time understanding a new subsurface operation, but that's not uh, always true. So I put the quotes from two studies, one to Altmark, um, where the public was well informed about climate change, benefiting the local economy, but their uh, concern, their risk, um, their concerns about risks remained high, could not be reduced. Um, and they were not gonna have this project and the project did not go forward because of uh, withdrawal of public opinion in large part. Another, uh, uh, the, the other experiences that reported by Locke um, uh, and who, who felt that they'd had, a, uh, that Total had had a long experience uh, for two generations, that the uh, operator had some dialogues, it was not without drama, but they, uh, because they were, were an economic and also political power in the area, um, because they had a good track record and trust with the public um, that they could control risk. And uh, the, the, the same arguments that were not successful at Altmark were successful at Locke. So um, I think this is a lesson of not assuming the public will be with you, but um, building on, th there are some tools for a depleted field that could be used to be built on to, uh, if past experience of the public has been generally positive, they could push uh, in a positive direction. Next slide. Um, so existing, we worry about existing wells. I worry all the time about existing wells. Sometimes I wake up at night worrying about existing wells. Um, uh, but they, in, in the case studies, the existing wells were successfully repurposed for storage projects in all the cases. So by spending the money and the due diligence, you can make them work. Absolutely can. Here's the, um, here's the, uh, Wasson Field. Wasson Field's been under CO2 injection for decades, many decades. They just got, um, five years ago or so, got a, um, the first um, uh, qualification to receive 45Q tax credits. They had to put in a monitoring plan in a, through a, mon a separate slot in the U.S. I won't bore you with, but they had a, an approved, EPA approved monitoring plan. These wells were found acceptable. And they are, and they have H2S in the field and they have H2S monitors at the surface, they are performing. So that many wells, you can remediate them and bring them back into operation. However, um, the wells are not without trouble. So in our case studies, we see several long complaining reports of troubles with wells. Um, K-12B, Otway, Grandfield, each have an elaborate story about, especially about reuse of existing wells for mon monitoring. There, so, uh, they're both sides of this coin. That's it for me. I'd like to hand it on to Sahar. Yeah. Thanks. So, <clears throat> so as Alex mentioned, one of the objectives of this study was to see uh, how residual hydrocarbons as one of the uncertain factors impact the storage capacity of CO2 and the effectiveness of CO2 trapping in depleted gas reservoirs. Um, so next slide, please. So we use reservoir simulations for uh, this purpose. Uh, so the reservoir model was built using properties of the so-called HC sand uh, as a typical example of offshore Texas. 
Uh, the Miocene Age is, is, is a natural gas producing reservoir uh, in the High Island 24 L field uh, located, located in offshore Texas state waters. Uh, next slide. Okay, so let me explain the workflow that we followed uh, for the for the reservoir simulations. Uh, we initialized the reservoir model in its uh, pre-production stage, uh, initially filled with hydrocarbon gas or let's say methane and residual brine. Uh, the reservoir was considered to be closed with no flow boundaries and no hydrodynamic contacts with an aquifer. Um, so prior to the CO2 injection scenario, uh, we conducted several gas depletion simulation to achieve different recovery factors or different volume of the remaining gas uh, to see how uh, would be the effect of this residual gas on the storage efficiency of CO2. Uh, the gas depletion, depletion scenario was done through five production wells. And in the figure on the left, you can see how the reservoir pressure and volume of the gas in place evolve uh, during the production stage for various uh, ultimate recovery factors from 70% all the way to, to 95%. Uh, next slide. So after a desired recovery factor, gas recovery factor is obtained and reservoir pressure becomes stabilized, uh, the production will be shot in and we, uh, the CO2 was injected into the depleted reservoir uh, that contains you know, different levels of residual gas. Uh, CO2 was injected for 10 years, uh, followed by 100 years of post-injection. Uh, and these figures represent the distribution of CO2 plume and CO2 saturation in the reservoir, uh, which contains 30% and 5% remaining gas in place. Um, so based on the simulation results, we learned that the amount of residual hydrocarbon and methane uh, doesn't adversely affect the CO2 storage capacity. Um, so based on our observations, uh, the lower density and viscosity of methane relative to CO2 uh, favors the accumulation of methane, methane in, in, in the shadow depths of the, of the uh, shadow depths of the reservoir, uh, right under the top seeding layer. So in other words, we can say that you know uh, the, the resident gas, which is uh, present in depleted reservoirs, acts as a cushion gas and prevents CO2 plume from reaching the top seeding layer of the reservoir. Uh, and um, its effect is even more remarkable when we have a, a higher uh, volume of gas in place in the reservoir. Um, so we can say that you know, a depleted reservoir with a higher amount of remaining gas may provide a uh, you know, better CO2 storage integrity because the formation of a T gas cushion, uh, it, can increase, it can decrease uh, the risk of CO2 migration uh, toward the top seeding layer in the post-injection stage. Uh, next slide. Uh, so we also quantify the amount of CO2 trapping efficiency uh, in the depleted reservoirs, uh, which contain different remaining gas in place. Uh, so these figures compare the percentage of stored CO2 in the form of uh, free gas, residual trapped gas, and dissolved CO2 in reservoirs with different levels of remaining gas in place. So according to the results, uh, we learned that uh, the majority of CO2 plume remains mobile. Uh, as a free gas. So it is like 75% of CO2 being as a free uh, base in the reservoir, and we see that only 20% and like 30% of CO2 in the form of residual trap and dissolved CO2. Uh, we also observed that the amount of remaining gas in place doesn't significantly affect the residually uh, and, uh, trapped CO2 and the dissolution trapping efficiency of CO2. Um, so now the question is that why this happens? Uh, so we know that you know uh, the presence of brine plays a key role in residual and dissolution trapping of CO2. And in the case of depleted reservoirs, uh, brine exists in its residual saturation. So this low saturation of brine limits uh, you know CO2 residual and dissolution trapping in these depleted reservoirs. Next slide. Uh, so key, key takeaways of this study was that the presence of remaining hydrocarbon gas in place doesn't negatively affect the CO2 storage capacity, uh, and the gas or a methane layer forming below the reservoir, uh, reservoir top may act as a barrier, which lowers the risk of CO2 plume migration toward the top sea. Uh, also, the amount of remaining gas, uh, gas in place doesn't significantly affect the capillary and dissolution trapping efficiency of CO2 plume. And just one suggestion that we have to better engineer the residual and dissolution trapping of CO2 in depleted gas reservoirs is the uh, reservoirs that they, they have no flow boundaries, they are closed boundaries. Uh, one solution could be you know, using water alternative CO2 injection scenario to promote residual and dissolution trapping of CO2. Uh, 
Next slide. So some uh, fields such as K-12B field in North Sea uh, are highly pressure, uh, pressure depleted. So at the end of production, the, the reservoir pressure has been way below the hydrostatic, uh, uh, hydrostatic level. So we also did another in investigation to see how pressure depletion can create more pressure states for uh, CO2 storage. Next slide. So to this end, and we look at the interplay of pressure depletion and the reservoir boundary condition and investigated how it can affect CO2 storage capacity. Uh, so we consider different scenarios, including different reservoir boundary conditions and initial reservoir pressure conditions. Uh, and to estimate the storage capacity, we use our in-house uh, in tool called Easy Tool, which is an analytical simulation toolbox for uh, estimation of uh, dynamic storage capacity of CO2. So we created a generic model uh, using typical Gulf of, uh, Gulf of Mexico reservoir parameters, and we looked at three different scenarios. Uh, for scenario one or the reference one, uh, we considered uh, a reservoir with hydrostatic initial pressure and closed boundaries uh, that represents a wet reservoir with no connection to a large aquifer. And for second scenario, we considered a pressure depleted case uh, with uh, closed boundaries which represent a post-production field with 50% pressure depletion. And for scenario three, we considered a large aquifer uh, case with hydrostatic in initial pressure and open boundaries, which represent a post-production field with a good aquifer connection and no pressure depletion. Uh, so CO2 injection was modeled for 20 years and using uh, our in-house tool, we quantified the maximum storage capacity of each scenario. Uh, next slide. So according to the results, uh, we observed that the open boundary reservoir uh, offers a capacity of around 10 times uh, that of uh, the, the pressure depleted case. Uh, so we can say that open boundaries uh, provide a larger storage capacity uh, by allowing pressure propagation towards uh, the, the reservoir boundaries. Um, so, however, we, we, we should keep in mind that by considering an open boundary reservoir, uh, we may end up with a larger area of review that may impact uh, surrounding uh, storage projects and it, it may increase the cost of characterization as well. So there is a trade-off between the increased storage capacity and additional characterization costs when we choose an open boundary reservoir for this storage purpose. And on the other hand, uh, you know, even though a reservoir with closed boundaries offers limited storage capacity, we have to keep in mind that uh, they have closed boundaries. So we will have a project with a limited footprint of CO2, and it lowers uh, the cost of leasing acreage and monitoring uh, requirements. So that's pretty much uh, about the uncertainty study that we did. So over to you, Josh. Great. Um, yeah, thank you. So uh, my name is Joshua Rhodes. I'm a research associate at the Weber Injury Group at the University of Texas at Austin. So I'm in mechanical engineering. So any and all questions about um, how things work below ground, I will deflect to my esteemed panelists here. Um, but generally, I'm like a systems level engineer looking at infrastructure. And so looking at um, the, the pricings of different types of infrastructure, my part of this project was to look at what would be um, to, to try to get a, you know, kind of bound the cost for um, reusing uh, infrastructure versus uh, versus uh, building new infrastructure uh, outright. Next slide. So as any good engineer will say, the answer is complicated, right? And a lot of it depends on, um, on a lot of things, but we wanted to, next slide, um, take a look at, uh, to, to look at this, um, look at this project or, or look at this um, sector through um, kind of a consistent set of four a uh, consistent set of criteria under four scenarios, and so we developed a, a consistent scenario where we're going to um, we're going to inject uh, one million tons per annum of CO2 for uh, 25 years, and then monitor it for 20 years um, after that. Uh, for four scenarios, one where we looked at all new onshore infrastructure, another where we looked at the reuse of existing onshore infrastructure, um, and then the um, new offshore and reuse of offshore infrastructure. Next slide. So each uh, scenario uh, is, is um, evaluated based on, on multiple criteria, um, things like you know drilling pad or uh, um, or um, um, uh, well structure, um, offshore uh, platform, 
uh, equipment, um, well cost, uh, pipeline, and kind of other auxiliary infrastructure, all of it, you know, kind of detailed um, out in the, uh, in, in the paper. Next slide. So the first one we looked at was uh, new onshore infrastructure. So if we build everything from new greenfield, we estimate that infrastructure with a new 50 kilometer pipeline on average, Rickon would cost about 40 million um, US dollars. One of the things, there's lots of uncertainty around different parts of uh, different parts of infrastructure, particularly now with supply chains being all over the place um, and the, you know, the cost of materials being, um, being everywhere. So one of the things we, we did in this scenario is we actually um, did a sensitivity based on kind of the major portions of, or the major cost uh, portions of each of the, um, of each of the systems that let, that, um, um, that overall were the, uh, that made up the uh, made up the local project. So we um, took the pipeline cost and estimated it would if it was you know a third cheaper or a third more expensive. And you can see kind of how that changes the overall cost. So that takes it from 30 million to 50 million. We also reduced or increased the pipeline length by um, you know 20 by 20 percent each way. The well injection capacity, which we assumed to be about 0 0.5, 0 0.57 million tons per annum. So on average, you know, needed about two. Although if you reduce the well injection capacity, you might need three um, wells. And then just generally around the well, um, the well cost, um, 20, 20 plus percent. So each of these taken individually kind of shows the range upon which, um, you know, one might could expect with our, our default kind of assumption being that it's, you know, 40. Although if you could get lower cost on all of these, you know, you could, you know, move move the bar even further um, to the uh, to the left. Next slide. When we look at um, existing onshore infrastructure, um, there's a couple other things that are um, that uh, that Sue brought up in terms of you know existing wells and maybe not having records and you know having to deal with um, you know what do you do if uh, if um, if you don't um, if you're not sure about a well, if you have to go in and check or if you have to go in and do things kind of about it. So um, but we estimate if you're able to reuse the pipeline, because that's the biggest driver of cost, that it could uh, reduce your, um, you know, your reuse costs down into the into the low tens of millions um, of dollars. However, if you do need a pipeline, if the pipeline that you have um, is not useful, then, you know, you're back to you're back towards your, you know, your 40 million dollar um, uh, 40 million dollar issue and then think about the the pipelines is you know existing natural gas pipelines are are, are generally you know designed to work you know you know around you know 13 to 100 bar or so um, but co2 delivered in a dense phase which we assumed in this project you know, need about 82 to 150 so while there is some overlap kind of on the on the lower end um, it wasn't uh, you know guaranteed that the existing line depending on probably depending on how old it the older it is probably the less the less useful it'll be. Um, kind of going forward, but then there are other things in you know existing fields. While you may know the subsurface um, much better, there may be you know unknowns about the existing infrastructure. And so we show um, you know whether there's you know 50 to 300 wells in an existing um, uh, location, and we assumed you would have missing records for about 10 percent of those, so you'd have to go in and check um, whether or not you. And then we you know iterated back on that whether it's five or 30 percent. Again, well injection capacity and well cost, similar to what um, we looked at uh, in the in the last one. So it can be cheaper, highly dependent on if you are able to reuse that pipeline. Next slide. Looking at offshore infrastructure. So again, going back to new infrastructure, looking at um, looking at new platform, new pipeline, new new wells, new monitoring wells, new things um, like that. About in about order of magnitude higher. So we estimating that it, you know is roughly around 400 million. U.S. dollars for the same, you know, million tons per annum, um, 50 kilometers worth of, of of pipeline, and then as we and then we, you know, um, you know, uh, did a sensitivity on the cost of of each of those, and so you know, reducing pipeline cost and length, um, and the well cost were kind of the biggest drivers of um, you know what could reduce or increase uh, certain cost, um, as well as you know well injection um, uh, capacity. Next slide. And then the estimated capital cost of reusing offshore infrastructure, assuming you um, reusing some of the the platform and things that um, the, um that exist. Uh, again, it came really came down to you know what the um, you know what the uh, you know the pipeline you know cost um, 
would uh would be. But we estimate that that would be you know 85 million or so cheaper, around 315 million, and then you know iterate it back and forth around based on uh, some of the similar things um, before. So offshore. Definitely more expensive for you know for 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 reasons that you know people who who drill underground will know um, uh, will know in their heart. Um, but these are kind of generally around the you know the cost of infrastructure. They can vary quite widely depending on you know how much, uh, particularly how much you know uh, you know pipeline if you're able to you know reuse that that type of thing. Next slide. <clears throat> So other elements uh, to consider in kind of new versus reuse, uh, you know, potential for, you know, as we we're going through these studies, you know, potential for less disturbance in a given area, social license to operate, I think we've been, we've, you know, has been brought up already. And then, you know, necessary services, site prep, well drilling, all these other maintenance and stuff are likely to be nearby if you have, you know, if, if there has been activity, you know, or is activity um, in that, in that area. Next slide. And then in conclusion, uh, kind of the, the biggest the biggest uh, the biggest piece that moved the needle here was you know pipeline status. Um, you know onshore might be better if the pipeline is not available, um, and offshore reuse might be better if the platform is uh, is usable. Um, but every you know project is going to be you know pretty site specific, kind of as we've um, as we've as we've discussed. And I think that's the my last slide, so I'll turn it over to Alex. Thanks, Jeff. So in the last 10 minutes or so of this, I want to come back to the question of screening and how you actually identify the projects that are worth progressing. So there are a number of published screening criteria. Some of you will be familiar with them. Uh, and they take the form that you see in the screen in front of you. They're long tables of parameters. They assemble really important information. You will need this stuff. But at the same time, the level of detail in them makes it difficult to compare opportunities just because they are so detailed and because there are trade-offs between different factors. So our motivation in this study was really to come up with something clear and simple. So what you see in front of you now is that clear, simple table. It's a one-pager and it focuses on headline criteria, which gives flexibility in the details. So we do define desirable ranges and boundary conditions and we make a distinction between this looks good and you really can't go here. That is the boundary conditions. But there are basically five categories for these things. One is subsurface parameters for pure storage. One is subsurface parameters for CO2 EOR. Third is containment security. Fourth is infrastructure. And fifth is, of course, public acceptance and regulatory approval. Where we can, we've created graphical screening tools to support these things. So trying to make this as straightforward and as easy as possible to identify which fields are worth investing further work in. Obviously, this won't, it won't get you all the way to project investment by a long shot, but it will rule out significant numbers of fields. So to take the first of those, injectivity forms a really nice example. And of course, injectivity governs the rate of injection for well. In detail, it's simply the product of reservoir permeability times thickness but you don't really care so much about what the reservoir permeability is or what the thickness is. You care about the combination. And the graph here, I wish I could take credit for inventing it. It is actually Nick Hoffman's invention. Um, it plots permeability versus thickness and adds these bands of rough injection capacity per well per year, assuming a vertical well to the reservoir. And you can see on there, there's a number of, of different uh, historic CO2 injection projects, but it divides it into bands, order of magnitude bands of injection rate per year per well. So we've got 10 kilotons, 100 kilotons in the white, we've got one megaton per well per year, and in the green, 10 to 100, even 100 megatons per year per well. Plot your reservoir on this, see where it falls. In terms of capacity assessment, Sue alluded to this, but we have enormous amounts of historic reservoir production data available to us in depleted fields. And by far the easiest way to assess capacity is simply to do a fluid replacement calculation. So bypass all the first principles about reservoir heterogeneity, reservoir thickness, permeability, porosity, all of that. Simply look at what did it do historically and equate the volume of CO2 at reservoir conditions with the historic net production that is the volume of oil and gas at reservoir conditions minus the volume of water injected. 
And the key thing here is at reservoir conditions. So inspired by Luke Hoffman's graph, we've tried to create similar ones for capacity for oil fields and depleted gas fields. And it's using, it's based on work by Agerton et al. in 2018, looking at Gulf of Mexico, but trying to equate um, formation volume factors with predicted CO2 density. So both of course are pressure and temperature dependent. There is a relation between them. And the result is that you can create a graph like this with formation volume factor on the vertical and cumulative gas production on the horizontal. And again, come back to the same, same set of bands of one megaton order um, capacity for the field, 10 megatons, 100 megatons, and so on. The assumption in here, and there are several, is that about 75% of the production, the voided space from production, can be reoccupied with CO2. In detail, of course, that does vary. Um, we see cases as low as 50% and as high as even 90%. So again, it's a screening tool, but it gives you a great quick look and a way of comparing multiple opportunities on one graph. In terms of containment security, I have come up with no such beautiful graph. So I'll give you the table instead. Um, but there's five, five things that we look at. One is topsoil capacity. One is topsoil character. Third is number of legacy wells. Fourth is the age of the oldest legacy well. And the fifth is the availability of well construction records. Um, there are a few hard and fast rules in here. You'll notice that it says suggested boundary condition instead of actual boundary condition. Um, these are suggestions. And our experience with screening, working with companies screening depleted fields and screening um, for saline storage is that different companies have different appetites for taking on different risks, legacy wells included. Some simply want to avoid them entirely. Others are perfectly happy to take on that risk. So it is very much a suggested boundary condition. The one thing I will point out in here is age of oldest legacy well. Modern cementing practices were codified in the 1950s, middle of the 1950s. So wells that are older than about 1955 pose a different sort of risk than wells that are a bit younger. And every country has its own watershed dates in terms of regulation you know, on well PNA practices and well completion practices. Do look for those watershed dates wherever you're working and do take them to, into account as you screen numbers and ages of legacy wells. There is one other thing on, um, on containment security. And Sahar showed you about closed boundaries or pressure depletion, which implies closed boundaries. <clears throat> In terms of capacity, of course, closed boundaries are far more limiting than open boundaries but they do have an advantage in terms of containment security. So first of all, they create a really well-defined footprint for the project with a well-defined monitoring area of well-defined police requirements. That has its advantages. But the second part of this is that you could repressure the field and keep the pressure not only below virgin, below the proven limit, but you can even keep it below hydrostatic, which means that all of the pressure from surrounding geology is directed inward on the field. It creates ultra secure storage, and it is a unique opportunity of really pressure depleted fields. So if pressure depleted or if security is really important to you, then definitely consider pressure depleted fields. In infrastructure terms, Josh took you through the economics, but there is some underlying work beneath the economics about what could be reused. And this table just tries to capture it. It's things like, pipeline diameter, current status of the pipeline, whether it is decommissioned or near the end of its service life, um, or has significant service life remaining. Pressure rating, he alluded to. The pressure ratings for gas are in general a bit lower than the pressure ratings for CO2. You can get around it by putting on-site compression at the, the injection site, but of course that adds cost. In-service dates, platform in-service dates, platform um, capacity in terms of space to put compression equipment or CO2 injection equipment on it really does matter. Um, so by all means, use the table to get a, an idea of what might be reusable. And then as Josh said, do your homework. 
The last thing is about public acceptance and regulatory approval. And there are some guidelines, local precedent and regulatory readiness for CCS, even if you can measure it, local public attitude towards CCS, all important. But the takeaway from these projects universally is engage early and often and identify the regional differences and the key considerations. Talk to the stakeholders early. Um, where, the, where we see projects encountering difficulty, it's been because the stakeholders sort of feel like the project is already a done deal and they're simply being asked to rubber stamp something. Early engagement allows you to overcome that and decide stuff. So conclusions, there are a wide range of case studies and analogs to draw from. And we've given you pretty detailed snapshots on 10 good ones that span, as Sue said, a wide range. The presence of residual hydrocarbons has only a minor effect on storage capacity and injectivity. Um, but as Saha said, residual gas does create a cushion uh, between the CO2 and the, the seal. So if you're worried about reactivity between CO2 and seal, and to be clear, we've seen no cases where that has been a major effect. But if you're worried about it, residual gas can give you some insurance. Pressure in depleted fields reflects in part, of course, the boundary conditions. Maximizing capacity favors the open boundaries. Maximizing security and minimizing the monitoring footprint favors closed boundaries. So pick your poison, as it were, or pick your preference and focus on that. Inherited infrastructure is highly variable. It may be an asset or it may be a liability. And in either case, it really does require case-by-case -case evaluation. In terms of screening, consider your objectives and the priorities. The accepted, expected emission streams and the project priorities should be fairly well known. So what you need in terms of cost and security and capacity, you'll have some idea of. But what we've seen is that different players come to this game with different boundary conditions and different objectives. Some want to maximize capacity, some want to maximize rate, some want to maximize security, others want to minimize cost. All of those things push you in different directions. So define the priorities early and then use the screening criteria to identify the things most likely to satisfy those criteria. The guidelines we've given you can certainly high grade sites, but they won't take the place of detailed evaluation. So with that, thank you for listening. And let me hand it back to, <clears throat> to IEA GSG to moderate questions. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Alex, and thank you all for that really interesting presentation. It was really good to go into more of the details, the nitty gritty of the study. And we've got absolutely loads of questions, so I'm just going to get straight into them. Um, so have you included fields with water and or gas injection, meaning fields where the pressure may not be too depleted? Yes, absolutely. Uh, as Sue showed you, several of the CO2 EOR fields have had extensive water injection um, and very little pressure depletion. They've largely relied on balancing injection and withdrawal. So, yes. Fantastic. Great. Okay, next question. Um, is the field suitability dependent on the planned CO2 phase while storing or injecting, e.g. dense, super dense, supercritical or gaseous? Good question. Hey, you know, a lot of these highly pressure depleted fields will initially store CO2 in a gas phase. The view is that over time, as you inject more and pressure them up, CO2 will ultimately be stored in a dense phase where it's liquid or supercritical. Um, the presence of gas, the super depletion and the gas phase creates tricky, tricky startup conditions because, of course, CO2 goes from dense at the wellhead for pipeline transport to gas in the reservoir. And then the expansion cools it rapidly. The acceleration can create vibration downhole. Um, it is tricky and there's lots written about it, but it is also manageable. We don't see it actually uh, limiting the viability of projects. Mm -hmm. so good question, but manageable. Great, thank you. Um, okay, so in the CO2 simulations, uh, did you have any mixing of methane and CO2? So, uh -huh. Yeah, I think this is a question for me. Yeah, we observed the mixing of CO2 and methane. And around the injection, well, you know, when we have a high density of CO2, we observe mixing of CO2 and methane. 
<clears throat> okay, the next question is about uh, more on legacy and abandoned wealth. So did you go into the specifics of evaluating the impacts or risks of legacy plug and abandoned wells when we're using the field uh, due to pressure buildup in the field during CO2 injection? Good question. It's a huge field um, and there is an awful lot written about it. We haven't gone into the details of how you go about screening legacy wells or assessing them but we can refer you to the literature on it, which is extensive. Yeah, thank you. Um, and Sahar, which simulation tool in particular did you use for the reservoir simulation? Uh, I basically use CMG, uh, the gem module, module of CMG for running the simulation for reservoir simulations. Okay, thank you. Um, and did you see any evidence of well or reservoir problems due to low temperature effects during CO2 injection? Mm, so we did a study on that, you know, uh, from that perspective. Um, so it was like, you know, a simple simulation that we that we ran. So I would say that it's more, you know, a complicated, you know, reservoir type of simulation to do that analysis. In terms of case studies, no, we haven't seen complication due to low temperature in the reservoir. It is definitely a consideration, mm -hmm. but we haven't seen it as a major factor. Yeah, okay, great, thank you. Okay, so next question. Um, so this uh, attendee uh, thinks that the global CO2 storage capacities in depleted reservoirs is estimated to be around 500 to 1,000 billion tonnes of CO2. That's due to recent estimations. Um, does this study help being confident that we might have this amount of capacity? Do you think it could be less or more? What do you think? Uh, it would help you get to an estimate of whether that capacity is realistic. We certainly haven't looked at it, and you can't extrapolate from the 10 case studies that we have to a, a global capacity. But this, the methods that we outline would certainly help you evaluate whether the fields that went into that capacity estimate might be realistically reused. Yeah. Okay. Um, we've got a couple of minutes left, so I think we can get couple more questions in. Um, so is, if a depleted reservoir is refilling by natural migration, will the refilling gas eventually spill the stored CO2 out of the trap? Interesting question. Um, you get into, there's a question of density and in general gas in the subsurface is less dense than the CO2. Um, in certain cases, the CO2 can be more dense than the water, and that's pretty limited. So yes, gas refilling a trap could spill the CO2, but where it goes is a wide open question. So some of it, of course, will dissolve. Some of it, of course, will be residually trapped. And assuming there's remaining free phase CO2, it will spill from the trap, but where it goes is a wide open question that needs to be addressed with Local, local knowledge of the field. And the following question is, is that consequential? Do you I, actually I be, care? I bet, you that there, I bet you that there's some, grab, you know, what, you can't reproduce complete uh, uh, filling in, in the 30 year injection period. There's gonna be a lot of um, imperfect sweep. And I bet that you get some extra space for the gas recharge. Because as boy as a geologic time evolves, buoyancy will will let the will let the CO2 move to occupy pore spaces more effectively, and that will make space um, if there's continued geologic rate gas charge. So I think you're probably fretting about something that's going to take care of itself. But uh, yeah. I haven't ever heard that question before. Cool question. <laughs> um, so I'll add a little bit to it. I actually have drilled in the course of petroleum exploration a case study in this. <laughs> it was a bit of an accident, but CO2 had displaced an original oil charge and gas, late gas charge then displaced most of the CO2. It does happen, but as Sue said, it happens on geologic time. Um, and as it happened in that case, we came along about 70, 80 million years too late to catch the oil charge. <laughs> so. It may happen, but I don't think it's a huge concern on the timescale of actual CCS projects. 
Okay, fantastic. Thank you for that insight. Um, and that is been an hour now. So I know we do have lots more questions. So I'm sorry if I didn't get the chance to uh, ask the panelists your question. And um, what we'll do is we will pass on the panelists all of the questions received today for their information. Um, and obviously feel free to contact them as well. Um, so to close this webinar, thank you very, very much to all of our attendees for joining today. And thank you massively to our speakers. So thank you, Alex. Thank you, Sue. Thank you, Sahar. And thank you, Josh, as well, for giving that really detailed and interesting insight into that report. So thank you very much, everyone, and have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Sam. You, Sam. Thank you, everybody. Bye, all. Thanks. Bye.